Good morning and welcome to worship on this perfect uh, summer Sunday to curl up with a book after worship is over, of course. Um, I'm on vacation for the next two weeks and the Reverend Sue Hertel will be leading worship for those two Sundays. And in case of a pastoral emergency, simply leave a message on the machine in the main office and um, Tammy will be in touch. Um, I know we're all very excited about moving into the next um, phase of reopening. We are awaiting um, a more specific update from the government of Ontario. Um, Most of us go to the government website and read um, a few general things about reopening. Beyond that, there are pages and pages of more specific information. So we'll be uh, reading that and uh, watching how things unfold over the summer. Um, Just out of interest, I attended an excellent webinar on the future of choral singing presented by the Canadian Choral Society. And once some others have had a chance to watch those recordings, we'll also be looking at things um, like the unmasking of our soloists and the return of our choir, once again ensuring that all is done according to government regulations and with the safety of those concerned in mind. God is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our opening hymn, number 255, The Living God Be Praised.
Those of you who weren't worshiping with us last Sunday may wonder where Dave is. Dave is actually behind the organ for the next few weeks, and we thank him for his leadership while Svetlana is on vacation. Let us pray. Holy One, the God of grace and mercy, who has guided your people throughout the ages, be our constant guide and stay. Be our comfort in sorrow, our companion in joy. Be the one who grounds us, yet teaches us how to leave the nest with confidence. Forgive us when we seek complacency over your call to action. In Jesus' name we ask it. When others judge our complacency, God understands and God forgives. Thanks be to God. I mentioned last Sunday morning that um, after most of two years of following other things like the story of Moses and Joshua, I've gone back to the lectionary for um, the summer months and um, this morning, we read a passage I have never preached on before, and that would be the beheading of John the Baptist reading from Mark 6. King Herod heard of the things that Jesus had been doing, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it's Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill John. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? Her mother replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Through these words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, as friends of Christ, we do sing out, even though we are not all here together, to sing out with one voice. We ask you, O God, to be with us wherever we are this day, that your word might touch our hearts and change the way we live. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So here I am on this uh, Sunday morning, the last one before two weeks of vacation, a day when I might have chosen to preach on something a little light, like one does sometimes for summer sermons. And we have before us the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. So in my usual style, I asked on Facebook this week, perhaps a bit flippantly, um, who could possibly have chosen this reading in the lectionary for a sunny Sunday in July? And um, it turns out a friend of mine was actually on the lectionary committee that chose the reading. So I humbly apologize, and I actually have really enjoyed my time with the story of John's beheading this week, if you can say that. Well, first of all, it seems like a good week to tell you a little bit about how ministers prepare to preach on any passage, but especially on a passage like this. The first thing is we always want to put the passage in context, which is to say we read what comes before it and what comes after it in that particular gospel. Because sometimes one gospel writer places a passage in a certain place in Jesus' ministry to emphasize a certain point. So it's good to know where the passage is placed and why. Then we consider the main thrust of that particular gospel because each gospel writer usually has a particular sort of theme. And then we look at the historical context in which the passage was written. And then we read as many commentaries as we can fit into our schedule to see what the experts have to say about the passage. I am not a scholar of Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, so there are times when those who are can shed particular light on a passage because of variations in translation, which can be helpful. I mean, we all know when something is translated from one language to another, things can be lost in translation. And we even know that between the English translations of the Bible, there can be interesting differences in meaning. Anybody want my job now? (laughs) I have to say, I'm not a preacher who tends to share all of the details from that research with you in my sermons, partly because it would take at least half of the time allotted for a sermon just to do that. But I assure you that work is done faithfully each week behind the scenes. So today, I actually do want to talk a little bit about some of that before I launch into this theme that I think um, this reading presents. So first of all, let's remember again why John the Baptist ended up with his head on a platter in the first place. Herod happened to have decided that taking up with his brother's wife was a good thing. Now, there is an Old Testament precedent for a woman to be taken in by a brother-in-law, but that would normally be in the case of her brother-in-law's death, of her husband's death, not while he was still alive and well. So John, like the prophets of old, had a few things to say about Herod's choice. And Herod obviously was not looking for the answer that John gave him. Now let's look for a moment at where Mark places this story in his gospel. It comes right after our reading from last week 
about Jesus sending the 12 out to proclaim the good news, warning them they might not always be well received. And then following this story today are stories of Jesus' healing ministry. I could say more about the context, for I have to say, once I decided I wasn't going to avoid this passage, I actually really enjoyed everything scholars had to say about it. But we only have so much time. So what's the truth in this passage for us as faithful followers today? Well, being a faithful Christian and being willing to speak God's truth of justice and righteousness is not an easy calling, so this passage tells us. And it's not so much about being blessed by a peaceful life as it is about being willing to dodge the bullets, so to speak. I know that truth all too well, as sometimes people mistakenly feel that coming to church should be a time of peaceful reflection where we simply offer comfort from life. And that is one of the important things we need to do. But it's not a place where our preconceived notions of what it means to follow necessarily are confirmed. In fact, most often I believe that an important part of being part of a faithful community is more about being disturbed by God's word and then equipped enough to get back out there into the world to fight the good fight so that more of God's good news of justice and righteousness will be heard. Herod could have stood up to his daughter and his wife's bizarre request for John's head. But instead, he decided to keep peace in the family. John could have chosen the easier road, the more comfortable road of buying into what was expected of him by the power systems of the day. He could have chosen to keep peace with the establishment. Imagine the life he might have had if he had simply put his integrity aside to smile kindly upon Herod's transgressions. But he knew that was not his calling. There was a greater peace he was called to keep. We all face that dilemma as Christians who are active in promoting God's love in our daily lives. I face that dilemma every time I'm presented with a scripture passage that can be interpreted in a variety of ways. You know, just the fact that there are so many different denominations within the Christian church tells us that there is never just one way to understand God's word as it comes to us through the stories of our faith. And as one commentary mentioned this week, every time we as clergy preach on a complex passage, we are like flies caught in a sticky web of congregational politics, well aware that we have to choose between preaching an easy word that will keep the peace and raising issues that may well disturb and disrupt. Our reading today reminds us that each of us, by the way we live out our faith, makes a choice on a daily basis. We choose the way we speak to others. We choose the way we treat others. We choose the issues upon which we're willing to take an unpopular stand and the ones we're willing to keep silent on 
in order to keep what we believe to be peace essential to the well-being of institutions, that of family life, of primary relationships in families, of friendships, or of the church we call home. In the story of John and Herod, with the choices each of them had to make, we are reminded clearly that each time we choose to speak out for what we believe to be right, there will be consequences. Herod chose to keep peace in the family. John chose to speak against what he believed to be wrong. One ended up with his head on a platter, and the other, perhaps, eternally troubled by his choice. Who knows? So when the question of who this new prophet is comes before Herod, and Herod thinks perhaps it's John come back from the dead, he has reason to be disturbed. And disturbed he is as Jesus' ministry unfolds, for yet another encounter with a strong leader awaits him. And we all know how that story ends as well. May God grant each one of us the courage to stand firm for what we believe to be right. Thanks be to God. That's uh, one of the hymns in More Voices I don't think we've sung before, and um, the words in that hymn echo the message I mentioned from our moderator a few weeks ago that we should listen, learn, and then act, and you'll be hearing that theme um, a fair bit over the next few months. As always, we are so grateful for your gifts to support the ministry of this congregation. We're also grateful for your support of um, the, um, oh gosh, what was that, um, Buy an Acre campaign? 
Canadian food grains. I should write everything uh, down. Um, we're also grateful for donations towards the bags for women who have escaped human trafficking. Six more are almost ready to be delivered. And we're also grateful to Barbara Warden and friends who collected a large supply of goods for restoration second stage housing that has opened a home for some of those women who have escaped trafficking to get back on their feet. Indeed, the way we live our lives is an expression of God's grace and love. Encourage us always, God, to leave comfort and security behind in order to act in your name. Bless all we are, all we do, and all we offer for your work of grace and love. Amen. So today in our prayers of the people, we ask God especially, even in the midst of um, relaxation and summer fun, to encourage us always to listen clearly for God's word and then to act. Let us pray. Even in the midst of summer relaxation, where we seek rest and recovery from life's pressures, you still call us, God. You call us constantly to make choices as your disciples. In every interaction with others, the choice is ours to speak your words of healing and hope or to simply keep the peace at any cost. Help us, God, to be open to the truth you speak. We believe your truth to be revealed in your word, in the history of your people, in the reflection of others who seek to interpret your word. And so we ask for your wisdom to guide us as we seek to discern the word you speak to your people today. We remember as well that your word is a word for all people. And so we must be cautious not to only interpret it according to our privileged, affluent lifestyle, but always wondering how others might see things from a vantage point so different from our own. There are no easy answers in our life of faith, and so we simply ask you to keep speaking through the hearts and minds and voices of your faithful prophets of today, and to give us wisdom to discern and courage to follow. We ask in the name of the one who taught us how to pray and how to follow. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We have been led faithfully throughout all generations by a gracious God. May we remain open to God's leadership for faithful followers today. Hymn number 650, O God of Bethel.
go forward now to listen to the stories of others as they share their experience and their encounter with a gracious God. Go forward eager to learn how we can better exemplify God's love today and go prepared to serve God always with kindness and with grace.